Okay, thanks. So we had a whirlwind tour here, and I'm going to try to uh, keep us on schedule. Um, although I said I was going to use every minute, I get 45 minutes. We're starting late. I'm going to end late. Now we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Um, so a little bit about uh, the journey that, that we're on here and uh, where we've come, you know, where we're kind of standing today. I'll use some of our meaningful use statistics to elaborate on that. Um, and then talk about the key priorities, really 2013 moving into 2014, um, really around the stage two meaningful use criteria. But even if they weren't in there, I think there are things that there, a lot of us are uh, working on, and that's health data exchange both in the concurrent management of patients as well as the retrospective um, exchange that's required for some of our changing payment models. Um, and talk about patient engagement, which we've had a, a nice uh, time this morning already uh, talking about. And then talk about this pivoting into the future. How are we actually gonna use health IT um, to, to launch some of the things that we know we need to do related to uh, changing the way we deliver and pay for our care. Um, so the remarkable journey of meaningful use, these actually are not the current statistics. Uh, turned in the slides uh, early enough that uh, three months worth of stats have come through since this. Um, this actually is the meaningful use statistics related to eligible provi uh, providers or professionals. Those that are registered are in the red and those that, uh, excuse me, are in the pink. And the percentage of those that have been paid already through either the Medicare or Medicaid program are indicated in the red. Um, now, these are the December statistics. I'm going to read you the March statistics, which literally came out yesterday. Um, in the space of the total professionals registered, it's been increased to 386,000 um, for 74%. So that's gone up fairly dramatically. Um, but one that's gone up even more dramatically as of March are the number of professionals who have been paid uh, in either the Medicare or Medicaid program again. It's up to 255,000 or 49%. So close to half of the professionals have um, registered for the programs and been paid. So it's really kind of exciting. Um, now, again, some of you know uh, the Medicaid payments can be made uh, for not achieving meaningful use, but for being on the journey. Um, so it's the sort of selection um, and getting prepared um, part of it. So here's another way of looking at um, the statistics. And again, it's not a real dramatic hockey stick, but it's definitely going up. And this is pulled from the NAMSI's data, just showing since 2001 to 2012, those that have reported, and the NAMSI's data is collected through a um, uh, telephone survey usually. Uh, so it's uh, self-reported information from offices, ambulatory settings, as to um, what, whether or not they're using an electronic health record. And again, you can see that um, in 2012, 72% of doctors reported that they were using an electronic health record. Um, one of the things I always like to do when I talk about these statistics is advertise that this data is in fact public and you don't have to come to a talk and listen to me do it. You can actually get the data yourself. So the URL uh, for this information is listed at the top of the slide. And I believe our slides are available, correct? Going to be available, yes, for any of the attendees. Um, so if you do wanna drill down on this information, you can actually see it by state. And then within a state, you can actually drill down to county data. Um, now the state-based data on these um, graphics are updated, nah, you know, it, we try to keep it monthly, um, but it does take some machinations, so sometimes it lags behind a little bit, the statistics that I'm giving you here. But um, on the map of the United States, the darker the blue, the farther along that particular state is in terms of provider adoption. And the lighter the color or the more the yellow it is, um, the less adoption there is in that particular state. So when I talked about 49%, that's an average in the whole country. And you can see it's broken up actually fairly dramatically um, between uh, pockets of activity. Um, again, being from Wisconsin uh, about two years ago, um, I'm very proud that Wisconsin is dark blue. Um, but again, you can really hover and you can actually drill down on this information. So um, helpful to, to see. Okay, this is the hospital data now. So moving away from the providers and into the hospitals. And if we look at the hospital data, they're doing obviously significantly better in terms of the percentage paid and then the percentage, percentage registered. And I'll update those numbers too because again, the ones on the slide are December. For March, um, in terms of total hospitals registered, we have 4,300 or 86%. So it's just gone up um, a little because it was already pretty high. And the number of hospitals who have been paid through Medicare or Medicaid 
are 3,800 or 77%. So again, we're making uh, pretty good strides. Now, in addition, again, to monitoring and tracking what's going on through the meaningful use payments, it's often helpful to use a different uh, metric as well. And this particular one is from the American Hospital Association. That is also a survey that is also self-reported. Um, this survey, though, is, is typically completed um, in a written fashion. Um, but I think it's like 67 or 68 percent of the hospitals turn this information in. So it is pretty uh, validated and can be extrapolated to um, uh, across the, the nation. And again, you can see a, a pretty sharp curve up to the, the right. Um, again, when you look at state-based data, you see pockets of activity. This particular one, um, the darker the blue, the more penetration, again, that there is. And um, the, the white are those that are right around the, the mean. And so, again, you can see that um, some states are, are moving ahead uh, faster than others. Now, I point out the state-based data because you probably care a little bit about um, your state, but in addition to that, I think it's an indicator to what we see happening with some of our current um, activities as well when we start thinking about things like um, exchange and the use of uh, personal health records and patient portals. We also see a pretty wide variety um, as we look at different regions and different states. Um, I think this is interesting information. It's also taken from the American Hospital Association survey and uh, looking at just the metrics, some of the meaningful use criteria um, from 2008 to 2012 and kind of comparing where we've come in different areas. And the one I really like to point out, and it's not going to be a surprise to many of you in the audience, is that last row, which is computerized um, physician order entry or CPOE. That particular one in 2008 was at only 27% penetration, and today we have 72% penetration on that one. So again, um, a lot of the uh, safety and best practice kinds of things that come with that, I think it's important to, to point that out. Um, now, are we always mining for those benefits and are we remeasuring those benefits? Um, no. And uh, being at the ONC and the federal government, we are constantly reminded about that by Congress as recently as last week. Um, are we getting our money um, for the High Tech Act? Are we getting our money's worth, if you will? And it's, it's interesting, um, those of you who follow this, this literature, the, the question last week was from six Republican um, senators, and it was specifically uh, looking at the exchange criteria um, and saying we haven't moved far enough in exchange, um, health data exchange or interoperability, and why is that? Um, and again, when I look at these kinds of things, I say, well, that's not one of the metrics we were actually trying to move at Meaningful Use Stage 1, right? Meaningful Use Stage 1 is about getting it in. You know, Meaningful Stage 2 is about changing the processes, particularly around uh, patient engagement and around interoperability, which I'll talk about in a minute. And so, again, if you have any opportunity to share your thoughts uh, with, with legislators, um, I'm hoping that you think we're getting some, some value. Um, when I just think in the aggregate of where we were, let's call it five years ago or even three years ago, as to where we are today, um, the type of attention that's paid, the amount of money that's been being spent on what I call modernizing healthcare, bringing us up to the uh, level of implementation of IT that we have in just about every other aspect of our lives. And the fact that we've been lagging so much is, is actually a travesty. Um, and so I wish we wouldn't have had to use an incentive program. I wish everybody would have just said, oh, it's the right thing to do and let's do it, like they did in grocery stores and like they did related to um, making flight arrangements or online banking. Um, but the value propositions, again, are very different. And um, so I, you know, we've come a long way and we have a long way to go yet. Um, but when I look at these individual things, I get excited about the fact that e-prescribing, for example, has come so far. And again, the safety benefits of not having to rely on um, handwriting and prescribing the drug that you think is the right one as compared to having that kind of support. Um, particularly in relationship to some of the discussions that Dan uh, Macy's talked about this morning related to the amount of literature you'd have to try to keep up with if you were going to even begin to think about um, doing best practice today. Okay, so in terms of, of total payments, um, as of the end of December, it was uh, $10.6 billion. It is now up to around $14 billion. And if you Followed this, you may recall that the total amount was around 20 billion. Um, so we very clearly and very solidly have passed the halfway uh, mark. And so it's it's 
pretty exciting since this was part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, meaning that it was the stimulus bill, meaning that we were trying to stimulate the economy and um, you know, get things moving in areas where it wasn't moving. Um, so I think we're getting pretty good value for it, but you guys can all be your individual judges on that as well. Okay, so moving toward this, this new area, uh, or not new area, but an area of increased focus um, in 2013 and 14, um, really thinking about creating this patient-centric record. Um, and I always like to point out that this is a, a concept that has absolutely nothing to do with health IT. Um, we can create a patient-centric record by trying and beginning to practice that way. And today, we don't practice that way. We really do practice in silos. So typically, if we work in an acute care organization, we worry about what goes on in that acute care organization. And all of our care plans and all of our pathways and all of our, our uh, processes stop at the time of discharge, okay? We don't actually create care plans that move into the community, that talk about what's gonna happen in either that rehab facility or long-term care facility or home care or just plain old back in the ambulatory setting. And how do we get that information to ensure that we have continuity of care? So what I'm really talking about here is the concept of having patient-centric health care augmented by a record that's patient-centric. And oh, by the way, would that not be easier if we went ahead and automated that? And the way to automate that is number one, get everybody on some kind of electronic system, and then number two, create the capability of those electronic systems talking to each other. Uh, now, interoperability and health data exchange has definitely lagged in, in our country, and there's been an important reason for that. Um, we have not created and used the standards that are required to do this. So some of you, how many have experienced going from one electronic health record to another? Okay, so that's maybe 20% of the room. Okay, for those who uh, did do that, how many of you were able to take the medications out of system A and electronically convert them into electronic system B? Okay, that would be a big zero, right? Um, and why is that? That's because we use proprietary languages for describing medications, right? We go out and we buy First Data Bank or Multum, and we hook those onto our electronic health records, and they're really great because they create the formulary, and they give you lots of uh, helpful information about drug-drug interaction checking and drug allergy checking, but in fact, they are not interoperable with each other. And I had to live through um, a couple of those kind of conversions. And I'm telling you, it is spooky and scary when you've got a hospital that has 500 patients, all receiving an average of around 10 medications, and you are shutting down one system and opening up another, and you are literally manually taking the medications out of here and re-entering them in over here, right? Does it give you goosebumps right now? Um, and so that's just a simple example. We could go on and on, right? We do not have standardization in lab data. We do not have standardization for the nurses in the audience of the way we do respiratory assessment or skin assessment or fall risk assessment. Um, for the physicians in the room, the way we code diagnoses, maybe, maybe, maybe we're SNOMED or um, ICD-9. I won't even say the ICD-10 word. <laughs> I, I just can't in all good consciousness. Um, but you know, when you, when you think about it, um, oftentimes even our problem lists were not coded. And so when we think about how we're gonna transfer from one electronic system to another um, for the purposes of interoperability, we do not even have the standards at the vocabulary level, okay? At the, I understand what you're saying. Now you can couple that with, we don't have the standards for how do you package them up with the wrapper and what that wrapper's gonna say. And then the transport standard of how we're gonna get it out of the vendor A's product into vendor B's product or organization A into organization B. So there's really, when we talk about the building blocks of standards, there's really three categories that we have to worry about, the vocabulary, the packaging, and the transport. Now, we're beginning to get some standardization in that, right? And so we're talking about things like um, CDAs and CCDs and consolidated CDAs. And those are the words that we're using in the meaningful use criteria, and those are the things that we're um, uh, trying to get people moving on. Uh, what worries me are people like uh, in Congress and maybe some regular people that are having care and hearing that we're doing interoperability are thinking, oh, they're gonna all talk to each other. And I'm like, well, they're gonna talk to each other, but it's like little packets of information that have name and 
problem list and allergies and problem lists. We're not interoperating everything right straight out of the box here. So it's important to keep in mind that this is going to be a progression as well and it is going to be um, a journey. Okay, patient engagement, I'm, I've got some additional slides to talk about there. Um, at the ONC, we've kind of created a model that we use, and it actually works really nicely with the NEHIC model that we showed this morning from the um, uh, Health Affairs article. And that was, by the way, February 2013. The whole Health Affairs issue was um, focused on patient engagement. Heck, there must be 20 articles in there um, from some of the leaders in this space. Um, we had, uh, the ONC had an article in there talking about our framework, uh, which is described here, uh, access, action, and attitude, um, and really some of the things that we're doing to create some um, national momentum around this as well. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so exchange is, is moving, um, going back to that, e-prescribing. E-prescribing has come a long way from where it was um, in 2008 when we really started um, looking at this information where almost nobody was doing e-prescribing. And now you fast forward to uh, middle of last year when this data was last updated and we've got um, all sorts of people even at the 100% level. So this particular diagram, the darker the green, the more penetration there is. Um, so again, you can see that we're, we're making some strides. Now, why did we make strides in that? Well, Meaningful Use can take some credit for that. There was a, a predecessor uh, incentive program uh, from CMS, the MIPA program, which also uh, incented this for a couple of years even before Meaningful Use. So we've made some great strides. Uh, in our country, about 97, I think it is, percent now of our pharmacies can actually accept electronic uh, prescriptions into their systems. So remember, the definition here is that it is entered electronically, it is transmitted electronically, it is electronically accepted into the pharmacy system at the retail pharmacy, and there's no like retyping or transcription going on. That's the definition here of e-prescribing. So again, this is really pretty exciting when you think about um, how far we've come. Some of the other areas, we're, we're lagging a little bit, we're going a little bit slower. Um, I'm, I'm proud of some of these statistics, and yet when you think about the, the universe and what we all could be doing, um, I, I'm not as proud. So first of all, we've made some um, great strides in vendor to vendor, uh, inter-vendor. I guess that's the right way of saying it, um, between customers of the same vendor. Let me be very clear. Um, where, you know, talking vendor, same vendor to same vendor uh, actually works very well. And within a vendor, the products are, are interoperating. So it could be the ambulatory to the hospital, it could be the hospital to the home care, um, where we're, we're able to exchange things um, pretty well. There's some pockets of activity like um, New England and HealthBridge and New York and um, Massachusetts where we're really seeing some um, strong incentives uh, at the state level um, to get these things moving and to get the uh, exchanges actually taking place. Um, many cases, it is not the uh, ONC funded state designated entities that are uh, doing all of the work. In some cases, it's integrated delivery networks or other pre-existing HIOs that were in those organizations. And I think the idea here was let a thousand flowers bloom and um, we're gonna see who has the value propositions and who has the sustainability um, to, to continue. Um, I believe personally that some of our health data exchanges will um, be able to toe the line and, and have the value and have the sustainability and some may not. And I say that because there's about a year left in this program now uh, for the state designated entities and um, I think we've seen, uh, similar to many of the charts I've shown, uh, a lot of variety um, between the states as to what's, what's working and what's actually uh, people are willing to pay for. Uh, but there's some statistics on the bottom for the uh, state designated entity ones. And again, that does not represent all exchange. That is the exchange we can measure because we expect our grantees for those state designated entities to report information um, quarterly. And that's how we get this information. Okay, so we're really upping um, the criteria at, at stage two. Uh, hopefully these are pretty familiar to you and, and not a surprise. Uh, devil's in the details, of course, and there's all sorts of fact sheets and uh, different uh, spreadsheets and things to help you dig down on what standards apply behind here and what the actual uh, performance thresholds and things are. Uh, E-prescribing has continued, um, and it has actually gone, gone up in specificity to not only being in the ambulatory setting and within the hospital, um, but it has to be at uh, inpatient discharges. Um, so there's a percent for inpatient discharges. These transition to care summaries I was alluding to already, it's that packaging of the consolidated um, CDA. 
you have to be able to create and transmit from your electronic health record, and you also have to be able to accept and decompose one into your electronic health record. So it has to be a two-way. Oh, and just for the record, that can't be the same vendor. It not only has to be a different organization, it has to be a different vendor. Now, if you're in a market where the, um, uh, maybe there's a monopoly on the type of vendor and you're gonna tell me that, well, you know, we can't do any cross vendor exchange because we actually don't have any other vendors um, to create that with. Um, not to fear, NIST, who is our, our test tool creator, is creating a randomizer website where you're gonna be able to log into that website and we're gonna randomly select a, a vendor for you to exchange with. And we've got some vendors who have already signed up to create little test sites where you'll be able to um, attach to their um, test sites and, and do the exchange with those test sites. Um, so the, the fun will begin in uh, October 1st. Um, lab tests and results from inpatient to ambulatory public health reporting. So um, immunization registries is a good one. We have uh, 48 of our states do have online immunization registries. However, almost all of them are for providers only. Uh, patients themselves cannot access them. So I love to tell the story about um, my daughter's uh, immunization registry, which is a card that I keep in my telephone directory. Um, and the funniest part of the story is when I moved to Washington, D.C., I, of course, have a cell phone, right? I don't even use the telephone directory anymore because all my numbers are in my cell phone. So I was going to throw away the telephone directory, but then I said to myself, well, that's where I store my immunization registry. So I couldn't throw away the phone directory because I was afraid if I did that, I'd forget where I put the card. And let's just say my daughters are 27 and 30, so this has been a, you know, a long journey. And that wouldn't be so funny, except that three months ago, my 30-year-old daughter called me and said, I need a copy of my immunizations. <laughs> She's moving to Singapore for a couple of years to teach at a school there, and she literally had to provide her. Even. So, you know, the story goes on and on. But there are only three of our 48 states who have online immunization registries that allow access by the patients themselves. Again, a travesty. So we're really trying to you know, step this up and say, come on, open the kimono. You've got providers looking at it. You've got to put a little extra security on it, but let's get this going for patients. Um, public health agencies for syndromic surveillance. I think you all know we've been trying to get activity going with that. We, the government, we in this case. So we're really stepping it up and, and um, trying to be a bit more specific about what's required there. Uh, reportable labs and then uh, cancer registries. Um, so, applying today, patient's ability to view, download, and transmit. View, download, and transmit. So, um, a huge, and this isn't just a step from stage one, this is like a giant leap, and you have to hurdle as well while you're leaping. Um, because what's going on here is we can't just um, let patients have this idea that they can look, you know, and we'll give them a little thing to look, and maybe they can even download it onto a jump drive like we asked at, at stage one. Oh, Wait, we only had to do a test of that, come to think of it. And so maybe we didn't really advertise it to our patients. We didn't wear buttons that say, you can have a copy of your electronic record, just ask me. We didn't do that, did we? Did anybody do that? I know I didn't. I was at Aurora then, I, I didn't do it either. You know, it was like you, were, you got past the test and you thought, whew, that was hard. Um, but we have to step it up. And so the criteria not only is the patient's ability to view and to download and transmit it to a third party. The third party could be their daughter who's managing their care. It could be another provider. It could be another health record. So they're downloading it from a tethered record because they're a member of Health Vault and they wanna take the information and put it in Health Vault. Um, and so this is gonna be tough and there's some uh, performance thresholds again, it's 10% of the patients. So we're actually gonna have to be advertising that we have this capability and doing it uh, and then keeping track of, of proving that we did it. Um, and then that last one, it's sort of, um, I, I think of it as a little bit wimpy, but it, it had to do with at least signaling that we wanna be able to have transportable data. So the whole purpose of that last one was to start laying the infrastructure for the ability to move from one electronic health record to another. So if you were interested in moving from vendor A to vendor B, that you'd be able to create an export summary and then you'd be able to import it. And there's some standards around how that's, that's being done. Now, would this actually allow you to do it with all that manual, without the manual entry that I was talking about? Probably not. Um, but it's at least, again, signaling what's gonna be going on and as we move into stage three. 
Um, so we know this stuff is complicated, and um, what, we, what we did was use some of the um, uh, money that we have for education uh, in this particular area on interoperability. So what we did was we created five modules around the stage two criteria. Each one of them is at least an hour self-paced learning. Uh, so if you don't know anything about this as a provider, you go here to find out what you need to know about that. The target audience here, again, is providers. Uh, vendors can hire smart people and or have smart people in this space, um, and they can read the regulations and understand it. We don't particularly expect uh, you know, the average provider to be able to do that. So again, these modules are really aimed toward the providers themselves. And um, it is a self-paced learning. Like I said, it's, it's fairly in-depth and they each take about an hour. So in addition to that basics one, um, there's a module for each one of the things that I just said was in stage two. So transitions of care, lab interoperability, the view, download, and transmit, and then the public health. And these are really, really good tools. And so if you haven't seen them yet, and they, by the way, have only been posted within the last few months. Um, we've also created some videos to help people understand how to actually do the reporting. Um, what things go in the numerators, what things go in the denominators. Again, often you're getting some of this information from your vendors, but we felt this was a, a helpful way to get some education going for providers. So there's also some other information out there, and, and again, the URLs are on here if you're interested in doing that. Um, I've been adding this to all of my talks because many of them are with, with folks like you who are out there in the field doing the, the good work. Um, there are some very specific questions as to, with this interoperability, how different things are going to be handled. Um, so we're giving you a little starter list of questions to ask your vendor. Will you be providing HISP services? Um, so health information service providers. Does the vendor provide that themselves? or will you need to party with a third party to create and provide that HISP service? Are there additional costs? Um, there's a HISP question again. Will I be using my own? Even if the vendor provides one, what if I've already got an established relationship and want to use a different HISP? And how will I send direct messages to providers using other HISPs? So these again are just a starter list of questions, and if they don't mean anything to you, take the interoperability module. Okay, moving into patient engagement. Um, this, is, this is a slide I just love to use because it it's just signals back to the day, you know. The obedience of a patient to the prescriptions of his physician should be prompt and implicit. The patient should never permit his own crude opinions as to their fitness to influence his attention to them. That was in the American Medical Association Code of Medical Ethics uh, from 1847. Uh, it is a new day, right? I mean, thank goodness. Now, that's true, it's a new day. But don't forget that many of our patients still think in this, this framework. And I always like to use my mother as an example of that. My mother would know, she's 88, um, she would no more ask um, for a second opinion or, or question her doctor you know, than, than anything. She just wouldn't. Um, now we're all trying to make strides with that. I, I have a sister who's a, a rad tech, so she's kind of in the healthcare space. I have a daughter who's a nurse. And so it's been kind of interesting as we, as we move along this continuum, uh, the thing we decided to focus on with, with her was medications. Uh, because she's on 14 medications, right? She has diabetes, she has arthritis, she's got um, high blood pressure. And so uh, interestingly, she I don't think knows what it means, but um, every doctor visit, and she's got three or four of those every month, um, the question always is when she's leaving the office, she's supposed to stop and say, did you do medication reconciliation? <laughs> um, we're making some strides with her because she knows she has to carry her med list. You know, we have it printed out because God knows the providers all, won't all be able to access it. Um, and at least having it printed out is, is that accurate piece of information. Um, but I've been talking with her and just like we will be talking with a lot of our patients about um, this is a new day. And you know, not everybody's like Regina Holiday, right? Who was up here earlier. Um, talking about she knows it's her right to get at this information. She's interested in getting at this information and, and she knows how to use it. Um, there, are, there are people that are still gonna have to get converted, if you will. And uh, my mom, I knew I was making some strides because she told me the other day they're doing new things for diabetes now. And of course, she's still back in Wisconsin, by the way, so these are always phone conversations, and sometimes I'm worried, sometimes I'm not. This time I thought, oh, what new thing are they doing for diabetes? I hadn't heard, you know? 
And, and she said, they're checking your feet. <laughs> now, it's a little scary to think that she just discovered that. <laughs> she hasn't, she's been a diabetic for like 30 years, you know? But um, point being, hmm? interestingly, somewhere along the line, there's a protocol somewhere now that's kicking off and every visit now her feet are getting checked, okay? Isn't that cool? And so I just acted like it was a new thing and let her think that we always, you know, learn new things and that's one of them. Um, fast forwarding to today though, this idea of patient is partnered, shared decision making, you know, engaging patients do demonstrate better outcomes. We know that. Um, there's a fair amount of research. And by the way, there's some good research cited in that um, Health Affairs Journal again, um, if you're looking to find some, some more um, uh, real didactic kind of information. Uh, there's also, of course, the incoming population, uh, and I don't know what age this starts at, where they just expect engagement versus IT. They expect to have that mobile app, right? Um, and it, it's intriguing to kind of think there's, there's a kind of chunk of people that are sort of sandwiched in between my mother and, you know, my daughter, and then I think, oh, that's me. Um, we're the ones that might want to think about engaging ourselves in some of these behaviors because as we use a personal health record or as we use a portal, the advantages of that will become more obvious and we will be able to more likely be um, solid, if you will, when we share that with our patients. So I encourage you all, if you aren't doing that, and I know there was a good chunk of people who were already emailing doctors. I was, I was shocked. That was a really good, I think he said 40% Ted did um, this morning. So I'm guessing that many of you have already done that, but I'd encourage you all to do it, if for no other reason, to gain experience with it and be able to talk to your patients about it. Um, these conversations need to start happening, and that's really how we're going to uh, change everything. 66% um, of Americans, based on a, a 2011 study from Deloitte, um, say they would consider switching to a physician who offers online access. And interestingly, by the way, some of the work that's been done in this space has actually showed that the hook for patients is not always the clinical data. Sometimes it's the ability to do appointments online, and sometimes it's the ability to pay bills online. So it's another way to think about when you're evolving your strategy at your organization, maybe you want to get started with those things which are a little less controversial, right? Online bill pay, you know, so wow, a lot of people are doing that. Start with things like that, the online appointments, and then work your way into the clinical data, which within an organization, again, may be more controversial. Um, so this patient engagement thing is really gaining a lot of momentum. This happens to be a quote that's been picked up actually by lots of different people. It was from Leonard Kish. Um, and he's an HL7 guy, but basically he coined the term that patient engagement is the blockbuster drug of the century. The blockbuster drug of the century. So this is gonna be more important than some of the advances that are gonna actually be taking place in drug therapy. Um, and a healthcare informatics picked it up for 2013 as one of their top 10 technology trends. So it's, it's definitely starting to gain some, some play, and I think now's the time to kind of ride that wave, if you will, and if you don't have a strategy within your um, personal life or you don't have a strategy within your organization to really think about um, doing that. So I mentioned the, the three A's strategy in terms of consumer engagement that we kind of coined at the Office of the National Coordinator. So it's getting consumers access to their health information, encouraging them to take action, and then shifting attitudes. So I'll show some examples for each of this. Um, in the access space, again, we've stepped up uh, in terms of patient engagement, the stage two meaningful use criteria. So there's reminders for preventive and follow-up care, educational resources that need to be required, this online access, visit summaries being provided, the fact that the patients should be able to send secure messages to their provider, and then that view, download, and transmit that we already talked about. So again, a significant stepping up of, of criteria. We've had a campaign for about a year and a half, it's creeping up on two years actually, uh, in September of this year, where we've asked um, organizations to pledge that they're behind this and that they will do everything within their power to make sure that this message gets out. And uh, pledges have been everything from insurance companies like Aetna and United, who have already um, done their portals and have allowed access uh, of to this information from their patients, as well as um, organizations like the American Medical Association and the American Nurses Association, um, right on through to healthcare provider organizations. Uh, and certainly this morning we were talking about Kaiser. Um, interesting, I have to do another personal story. Uh, 
talking about Kaiser, it reminds me that this mindset that we have in our country is kind of, kind of interesting about how insurance works, you know? So um, when I first moved to DC, my husband was still back in Wisconsin, and uh, he, we had to have an insurance that we could both have. Um, and there is no Kaiser in Wisconsin, so I, I picked Aetna. And, um, you know, we were never really asked to pick a doctor. We actually, you know, he happened to have to have surgery, so he actually had some encounters with the health system. But I managed to kind of sneak by and not see anybody for that year, which probably wasn't the right thing to do, but the word colonoscopy, okay, scares me. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, we switched a year later to Kaiser. And uh, that's this year, we're, we're now Kaiser. And the funny thing about it was how it was handled. So I, I get this email saying, you're now part of Kaiser, watch for information about selecting a doctor. Okay, so a little bit after that, a uh, piece of paper comes and says, you know, you have to pick a doctor and we'd like you to do that within two weeks. Okay, so you know, you get busy with your real life and I didn't do it in two weeks. So I got another letter and it said, um, you really do need to pick a doctor and um, oh, by the way, if you don't pick one, one will be selected for you. Um, I thought, whoa, they're like serious, you know? And so think about what they're doing. What they're doing is putting you into some provider's denominator. And once you're in that provider's denominator, what's the motivation for that provider to make sure that you get your preventive care or your disease management care? Hi, right? Because you know they're going to be rewarded based on certain thresholds, right? Um, and I don't really know that that's how Kaiser, you know, maybe they just give awards for people who have 90% mammogram screening rates or something, or colonoscopy screening rates. Um, but when you think about it, that's the kind of relationship we should be having with our healthcare organizations as consumers, right? It should be a partnership. This isn't about, you know, my weight is my doctor's problem. This is about, this is a problem we're managing together and we, we want to do this together. So it's just kind of an interesting, subtle way of me saying, oh, you know, duh, you know, this is really important stuff. Um, and so I encourage you to think about those things in your own life and again, then incorporate them into your practice as well. Um, so in this action space, um, ONC has been doing different kinds of innovative things to try to get this access beyond the real traditional. Now hopefully you've heard of the blue button, uh, and blue button was the, the pledge, and that's just give access. We don't really care how it is or what it is, just give access. The blue button mashup challenge was specifically looked at taking personal health information from multiple places and mashing it up together. So you can imagine a patient now who's maybe seeing uh, one provider in an ambulatory setting and a different provider in an acute care setting. They have data or portals or personal health records tethered in both, and they now want to pull this information together and, and mash it up into one. So it makes a lot of sense, and this was a, a, a great challenge, and I'll show you how to look at some of this information. We also were getting, um, well, you get them too, a lot of complaints about the usability of the design of electronic health records. And so one of the ways we thought we might spawn the industry a little bit is to create a design challenge about some of these summary screens um, that look at everything that's going on with the patient. And if we just got some really cool designs out there that are free, they're open source, that um, maybe it might spawn the industry to, to make some changes. So there was also a, a design challenge. This morning, we talked about the last thing, and that is um, this idea that patients are sometimes told that they do not have access to their record because of HIPAA. And that is wrong. I mean, that, I'm saying that is 100% wrong. HIPAA actually gives them res accountability and responsibility and authority to get copies of their health information. So I have the URL on here, um, and again, these aren't active like right now, um, but you will be able to get at that URL so that you can see the letter. And what the letter is, is Leanne Rodriguez from the um, uh, Office of Civil Rights has created a letter that a patient can print and take and give to their provider and say, see, I can have access. And it's on letterhead and it's got all the right stuff. Um, so encourage either yourself or again your patients um, if they, they're talking about some other provider who's saying that they can't um, get access. So here's this challenge website, it's challenge.gov. It has been out there for a long time and I was not aware of it until I worked for the government. So I found it kind of interesting when I was like, wow, this is like really cool stuff. And there's these challenge categories down the right hand side. Office of the National Coordinator is one of the challenge categories. And when you go to the ONC 
uh, list of challenge categories, you can actually see all of our um, existing challenges. And if you pick one of the challenges, you can actually get and see all the results of the challenges. So if it was an app challenge, you can actually see the app. If it was a design challenge, you'll see the design. If it was a video, you'll be able to access the video. So there's some really good stuff out there. And part of being part of a challenge is that it all is publicly available. So if you haven't spent any quality time with the challenge.gov website, I would encourage you um, to do so. Okay, how many people have seen this video? It's only a minute, a few. Okay, okay, I'm gonna play it then. It, it, again, it's only a minute, and it's a video that we created in the Office of the National Coordinator um, to help you use it with your patients to advertise the idea of consumer engagement. So we will... Advancements in technology are giving us the tools and resources to take control of our health. Health information technology, or health IT for short, is upgrading our healthcare system for the 21st century. Today's technology is freeing us from the confines of a paper world, giving our doctors, nurses, and ourselves the flexibility to access and share our health information securely when and where it's needed. Suppose you have a new doctor who needs the results of a past checkup. Or your father forgets which medicine he's supposed to take. Or your child has to go to the ER. Having online access to you and your family's medical history can save more than time. It can save lives. To learn more about how Health IT can give your healthcare a 21st century upgrade, visit healthit.gov. So again, I, it, there's a three-minute version of that that goes into a lot more depth, um, but you can, well, I guess I'll just minimize this because I don't know what else is on there. Um, you can see how it would be really helpful in advertising the idea that this is part of something that individual patients should be doing. Um, I mentioned challenges. We have consumer challenges that are, that are put out to the consumers themselves um, where uh, we probably have done a dozen of these, and they're in different areas like how do you use um, health IT to keep track of your medications? How do you use health IT to keep track of your blood pressure? How do you use it to make sure that you're doing the appropriate exercise? So this particular one is how do you use health IT to keep track of um, what's in your health record? And this, again, is, is kind of an interesting one, and it's only a, a minute long, so we'll quick do that one too. message huh yeah so again um, this is part of the creativity that that we see and actually some of them aren't quite as creative you know some of them is about uh, using pillboxes you know for by the day of the week and those kinds of things um, and keeping track in in a little application of health IT with using them in conjunction with the pillboxes but anyway the idea is getting exposure getting increasing awareness which is a, a super big thing so I'm gonna wrap up with just a couple of slides here, thinking about the, the big challenge in our future. And when we think about this maturation of the meaningful use criteria, we're really talking about starting with this initial data sharing and capturing into the advanced clinical processing, and then at stage three, really looking at the improved outcomes. And we've got a long way to go before we've actually, you know, synced up 100% with knowing which parts of health IT are actually making a difference to outcomes. And let's face it, just in the way that we measure um, outcomes. So when we think about where we're at with stage one and stage two, we're building on it. When we add in things like looking at what's required for um, uh, meeting the three-part aim, better health care, better health, lower cost, patient-centered medical home, 
And, and then what we're gonna need to really manage as an accountable care organization and into this whatever stage three is gonna hold, you know, there's really a lot of different kinds of things that are gonna be required for this. And so we're gonna be moving from just this utilization of technology and having access to the information to actually transforming healthcare. And this is where we've certainly been talking about how do you integrate it into your work? How do you change it? How do you change the way you're delivering care? And that's our challenge for the future. It's not just using that technology, but how do we actually change the way we're delivering that, that care? And in that mode, uh, and this is just for me to point out, there's a lot of accountable care. So people who, a lot of people have been telling me, oh, this is just the latest fad. You know, it's gonna be going away. Not so sure. Uh, there's 428 um, funded ACOs right now. But this is, this is where I really wanted to go, and this slide was shown earlier today. Um, this idea that we are going to need to become a learning health organization. We're really gonna transform the way we're delivering care. It's all about learning from all that data now that we're collecting up in that care circle, right? We have an electronic health record, so we're capturing lots of data. Oh, and soon it's gonna be codified in a way that we're gonna be able to amalgamate it between organizations and actually look at things that are going on you know, in states and nationally, not just within an individual facility. And that then is gonna allow us to do research easier, faster, and quicker, which is then gonna give us a bigger evidence base. And we're not gonna get leakage of the lessons that we could be learning because we're gonna be able to iterate that evidence right back in through order sets and reminders and the things that we put in for decision support, iterate that back into our care. So Dan talked this morning about that 17 years. I don't know, maybe we'll get it to shrink to seven, you know, or maybe two if you think about this ability once we have this all automated. So this is from the IOM report in September 2012, a very powerful report in terms of looking at quality of care in our nation and how it's been 12 years, believe it or not, 12 years since to air is human and crossing the quality chasm. And we have not, not made significant strides in the quality of care in this country. We still have mortality rates, for example, at, at birth that rival third world countries. We still do not adequately manage um, our, our patients under many, many, many disease conditions, okay? You may recall about two years ago, I think now, the study out of Cleveland Clinic talking about who gets um, correct diabetic care. And um, they had a statistic without a computer, it's like 17%, and with a computer, it's a rip-roaring 52%. And we're proud of that because it's better than 17. But shouldn't it be 95 or 97 or 98? And that's what we're talking about here. That's the power of what we're talking about eventually getting to, is making sure that we become a learning health organization and a learning health system and that we are actually able to iterate ourselves and learn as we're doing. And it's not an activity over here. It's part of what we do when we provide the health care. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>